Hello everyone, warm welcome to Timbro and this live streamed seminar on liberalism and conservatism. Uh, a seminar in this series of discussions that we have had over time on these questions of the borderlines between liberalism and conservatism, how we can define them and how we can understand them in our time and also starting in, in historical times. I'm Bjorn Hassegren, uh, senior fellow here at Timbro. And it's good to be here together with on my left, Professor Daniel Klein from George, Ma George Mason University, USA, mm -hmm. also associated to the Ratio Institute here in Stockholm. And to my right, I have Fredrik Hultgren. Um, Hultman. Hultman, sorry. Um, until recently, anyhow, uh, project manager for Timbro's uh, liberal conservative program. And we will do this uh, in the way that um, we are going to have a discussion around a paper that Dan recently has written on conservative liberalism, uh, on Hume, Smith and Burke as policy liberals and policy conservatives. And the idea is that, Dan, you start out by introducing your paper, um, uh, presenting it, discussing it, and then we will have comments from Frederick, perhaps comments from me, and there's also a possibility to uh, give questions and comments in the live stream uh, on Facebook. So, let's start, Dan. Okay, well, I'm always, uh, eager to talk about Hume, Smith, and Burke. Uh, in some ways, this is an intellectual history project, but since I want to embrace these guys, I also think this is what we should be. We should follow them. So in studying them, we're sort of putting forward uh, a suggestion about how to uh, think ourselves and think of ourselves. In some ways, this project, uh, that is my paper and some related writings lately, is a gesture for the American political landscape and the American political discourse, where I want to, um, on the one side, appeal to libertarians and classical liberals, Hayek types, and so on, very much uh, sources that I came out of myself, and urge them to be more mindful of a lot of the um, underlying issues of polity, political stability, integration, the course of politics, the paradoxes, and the um, compromises this requires for, for any viable uh, liberal uh, effort and vision. Uh, so I have sort of a, a, an appeal to the more libertarian side, if you like, in this, and then I have an appeal to the more conservative side as well, saying, look, there's really no alternative to the broad liberalism of the 18th century, in particular the liberal plan, as Adam Smith put it forward. And it doesn't make a lot of, see, you know, Americans are so pitted, liberal versus conservative, and that the conservatives, I think, I think that's very destructive and unfortunate. I'm not saying conservatives should start calling themselves liberals, but I do think maybe they should stop calling some of their political adversaries liberals and stop doing that pitting against liberalism. I want to claim Burke, in fact, as a liberal. Um, I'm not to, that's not to say he wasn't a conservative in important respects as well, but um, conservative, of, uh, Burke, of course, just like in Swedish, we've got the Burke conservative uh, pun mm -hmm. going, <laughs> but he's also actually a liberal. Um, now, in terms of more specific uh, breakdowns of this, I, I, that's not, this is not flipping, unfortunately, the, the uh, slide. Um, I believe it should be flipping forward so that everyone in TV land can see it as well. Cool. Um, I, I want to distinguish polity and policy. So let's start with polity, polity issues. Uh, what I have in mind here are issues that are about changes to the polity in a significant way. And these changes are not only in the constitution of government, but the polity in a broader sense, that is to say the culture and character of the whole you know, set, set of people within that polity. And when I say polity, it's perfectly fine to just figure I mean nation state. 
the top polity. We're not talking about the municipality so much. We're concerned about the top polity, the nation state. So all this relates to nationalism. So the polity issues are ones that stand to uh, deeply affect and maybe um, badly affect, from our point of view, the culture and character and spirit of the people of the polity, of the polity. Mass immigration is one of these great concerns, and this is an area where I would fault a lot of my good friends and colleagues who would advocate open borders. Schooling is another issue that's very much a polity issue, although that's not to say that I think it works in the direction of more government involvement in schooling. I'm just saying it does affect the culture and character of the polity. So this con th that concept is distinguished from the policy issues, which is an expression I'm using here in a somewhat tailored way. First of all, it presumes like we have in Sweden and in the US, a stable, integrated, and functional polity, certainly more functional here than in the US. Um, let's say the issues are domestic, to keep it simple. Um, and it abstracts away from changes, deep changes to the polity. And when will this abstracting away be most pertinent? It's when it doesn't change the polity so much. So a lot of economic regulation, a lot of social regulation won't deeply affect the policy, the polity in character and culture. And so you can kind of treat it as a policy issue in the manner that um, policy analysts and economists and so on often do and make these very, very, very strong arguments for liberalism, for liberalization. Um, and this whole way I'm doing it does often want to formulate the policy issue in terms of liberty, like more or less liberty. And so these are just some of the American context, typical kinds of things here. So these are Hume, Smith, and Burke, and I think they really nicely represent this um, idea of Polity conservatism, like being concerned about the culture and character of the polity, and policy liberalism. That is to say, generally we want a vision, we want a world of liberal policy. And so the liberalism is actually the primary thing. That's the kind of world we're hoping for. But we have to worry about these polity issues. So the, po the, the conservatism in my formulation, conservative liberalism, is actually a modifier of liberalism. The liberalism is primary. Let me just say a bit about these guys then. They're such giants and so rich and wonderful. Um, David, oh, so, so their policy, I'm saying they're policy liberals and policy conservatives. David Hume, advances policy liberalism in a, a lot of his essays. He also develops elemental understandings of liberty, of property, of ownership, um, of justice uh, that really help to formulate the very concept and clarify the concept of liberty. In his great six volume work on the history of England, he also explained this course of the integrated nation state in Britain, the rising up of the integrated nation state, within which all of this discussion is really taking place. Because mm -hmm. you don't get stable polity in Britain until about the time Hume was born, in fact. Um, and, and yeah, and so like I say, he, he, and he's very strong on policy liberalism. If you look at, uh, there are exceptions you could point to, but he's very strong on policy li liberalism. And then Adam Smith comes next. He and David Hume were very good friends. And Smith, he doesn't speak so directly to polity issues. He does actually maybe the most, uh, or some in his lectures on jurisprudence, which are just student lecture notes, some in the wealth of nations, and uh, you can certainly read certain things into the theory of moral sentiments in this right way, but of course what the wealth of nations does is really develop the quote liberal plan, the liberal system. And that talk helped launches the word liberal in this new political meaning, which then carries on essentially for a hundred years until unfortunately that meaning got muddled. Um,
so he, he, he's, I think he's in there the same. Now, Burke is, a, is, is more of a politico and a publicist and a statesman. Uh, he's not the man of speculation so much as he is the, po the working politician. And Tocqueville noted how in Britain there was a special coordination between these two different types of players. And I think he had these fellows particularly in mind. Um, Burke was, though, without question, a liberal. I mean, you just look through all his stuff. Uh, again, you could point to exceptions. Those exceptions very often have to do with these polity concerns, especially after the 17, after 1790. If you look at his works after 1790, he focuses on the polity issues in his, you know, deep concern, totally engrossing concern, consuming concern with Jacobinism, the French Revolution, the possible spread of this form of social movement and reform and thinking, which he thought was, um, you know, quite very, very, very threatening. Um, and he did so much to alter people's attitudes about it. So he's maybe best known actually for policy issues, but on policy, again, he is actually uh, very much a policy liberal. So I'll leave it at that, if that for now. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um, what, what about listening to you? I, I kind of think about these concepts, polity and policy. How do, how, how do you actually define them and how do they interrelate? Isn't it that a policy development might lead to a polity change and the other way around? Absolutely, and that's kind of <coughs> part of the motivation for this is that when we feel that it might alter the polity profoundly, and uh, particularly in a way that could be very bad. Mm. Um, you know, there's a sort of precautionary principle here. I'm actually affirming a kind of precautionary principle. Um, and so those policy issues where it's reasonable to worry about that, I'm saying, look, you have to look at those differently, and you have to pull back with your kind of impulse of policy liberalism. Mm because in indirect ways, liberty might actually be subverted, or just the good of the whole, in some other respect, might be subverted. Um, so yes, they very much interrelate, but part of, the part of the formulation of this idea of polity conservatism and policy liberalism is to kind of say, look, when we talk about policy liberalism, we're sort of abstracting away from those policy issues where that concern is large. Hmm. Hmm? Frederick, your comments and thoughts? Well, again, like from reading the text, I've felt that this was kind of like a, a confirmation of all my biases that I have. <laughs> like as a liberal conservative, uh, I've grown, and as a member of the moderate party and the moderate youth league, I, I've grown accustomed to seeing liberalism and conservatism as uh, sort of uh, belonging together, uh, that uh, and uh, for the last couple of years we had a, we had this debate in Sweden whether you could actually combine liberalism and conservatism, and it's become it's become sort of this defining discussion for moderates to say that yeah, of course you can. Uh, and when I looked at texts uh, at older texts by David Hume, for example, uh, and by Edmund Burke, I've made certain discoveries. Now, I hadn't uh, systemized it quite the way that Daniel has done uh, very eloquently. Uh, but I think it's very uh, fascinating to, to see that, well, like if you look at Hume uh, and the text, what was called uh, about the Commonwealth, uh, where he quite clearly uh, advocates that you know, reforms should be uh, made with a certain degree of cautiousness uh, to be aware of uh, uh, what uh, long-term impacts uh, reforms might have. Uh, and I noticed, uh, I found this quote by Samuel Johnson, who was a conservative back in the seventh, uh, 18th century, who once remarked that uh, David Hume is a Tory by chance. Uh, and th that sort of captures it, because I've noticed that a lot of conservatives uh, conservative thinkers like Russell Kirk don't want to describe Hume as a conservative, uh, but then when you look at someone like Roger Scruton, clearly a conservative, 
uh, he wants to kind of put Adam Smith and David Hume in the same fold as Edmund Burke and as Friedrich Hayek, um, which sort of explains why, uh, and I think it can explain a lot of our recent politics, like why could a, the Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher uh, become so liberal on economic policy? Uh, well, it's kind of part of the, the original liberalism or the original conservatism, depending on how you look at it. Um, but I was also thinking a lot uh, about, uh, well, just address another issue I think we have today. If we're talking about this dichotomy between liberalism and conservatism that often seems to pop up in the debate, I know it's very present in the American uh, debate. You can even talk about the dichotomy between libertarians and conservatives. Uh, I think bringing it down to a Swedish context, uh, we've got more of a dichotomy clearly be between conservative parties and liberal parties. Now I know that especially Bjorn thinks that you shouldn't look at the political parties when you want to uh, discover bright ideas. Uh, but I still think it's kind of telling uh, of the times we live in that there's this very strict dichotomy between conservatism and li liberalism. But if you go further back, you discover that uh, this dichotomy didn't exist. Like none of these people referred to themselves uh, as either liberal or conservative. They just had ideas and they belonged to political, or they had political affiliations that uh, are irrelevant today. Like their parties don't exist anymore to the extent that they had a party. I know like uh, Edinburgh was an old Whig. Um, uh, but, and, and I think that this sort of shows that uh, conservatives can't really deny their, liber their liberal heritage, uh, just as liberals can't deny their conservative heritage. Uh, and these categories, like it's really a case of, you know, reality resisting simplicity. Uh, and we have created these categories and we can't really uphold them if we actually look at uh, their origins and how they evolved through the centuries. I mean, uh, in Sweden, liberals and conservatives have formed many governments together and in many other countries that has been a normal coalition. I know in the U US, conservatives and more, uh, like if you've been a conservative, you could have been a social conservative or a fiscal conservative and, and those two things could be vastly different, but it's still, uh, but you've still been able to build political coalitions from that. And I think if you look at this shared heritage, it's, uh, it's easy to see why. Um, but I'm thinking why, like Nan, why do you think that we today, like we can today see conservatives and liberals to a further extent drifting apart? Uh, because we have this shared history of ideas. Uh, and the same thinkers were both liberal in some and conservative in some. Uh, are liberals just rejecting uh, uh, the importance of polity? Or, or are the conservatives rejecting the importance of liberalism in policy? When you ask that question, what country do you have in mind? Because <laughs> um, I, yeah. I think I have both the US, uh, like the US, probably the UK and Sweden in mind. Because when I look at, if you, I look at the conservatives in those countries, I think that the sort of liberalism in policy uh, is not as clear anymore. And if you look at the more like libertarians in the US, I think that they, uh, that many of them, perhaps not all of them, still haven't, or my impression is that they haven't come to terms with uh, conservatism in polity, always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there's certainly more po polarization going on in the US. I, I really don't know if that that's so true in Sweden. Yeah. And the polarization, Republican, Democrat, um, if we want to denominate that in terms of po conservative and liberal, that would be the American meaning, the North American meaning of liberal, the current North American meaning of liberal, which I disapprove of, um, and I don't use, in fact. Um, that is growing more polarized, and I think the left is getting more, further and further away from 
proper liberalism, frankly. And in terms of the Republican Party, I think that's extremely diverse, that's much more diverse and coalitional. And to talk about the Republican Party philosophy is quite misleading. It's more, these are folks who don't like, who, who think that the Republicans are the le lesser evil. Um, I see the left as more well-defined, generally speaking, and then there's the non-left. Yeah. And, you know, Steven Pinker has this analogy about the left pole, kind of like the North Pole. Yeah. So there's like the left pole, and the further you go away from, you know, the, the, the left pole, you're going right. But you could be going in all these different directions. Yeah, exactly. um, and I kind of think that that's what the right is. It means really non-left. Um, and so partly, I mean, I have to say, I think the Democratic Party is getting worse, has been getting worse rapidly and greatly worse, um, by and large. I think it's true in Britain, too. I don't think it's so true of the left parties in Sweden, uh, although I'm not really sure about that. I don't think, well, you guys can speak to that. Um, look, your, your comments are great. They're covering the kind of these big issues, and it's about these different meanings of these two words, conservative and liberal, and sorting those out. Um, one way to think about the conservatism that you and I want to very much affirm is that it wants to conserve classical liberalism. I mean, that's one way to kind of really put it together. I mean, what does the word conservative mean? It means preserving, conserving something. And then it's an issue of what is being conserved. And so it's very, in that sense, dependent on where they are in history, uh, what they're looking back on and have to conserve. Um, but conservatives, conservatism in the 19th, 20th century in some ways was largely, hey, we want to preserve the original arc of liberalism from this new onslaught at the end of the 19th century going into the 20th of the governmentalization of social affairs, um, which came with a whole bunch of different kinds of social and political changes that maybe partly drove it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some <laughs> things I didn't answer, but yeah, yeah but just to uh, touch uh, touch upon that, that I think uh, because this is like the question you always get as a conservative, like what do you want to conserve, like what's the yeah. point, and I think in different countries you refer to different things because you have different political histories or something. Right. Uh, but if you try to like abstract that and generalize it, like I, I guess you could say, like you just mentioned, that it's about sort of preserving liberty. But then liberty doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's True, it You're exists in a right. social so, structure. So it was very right. in, insufficient what I said about yeah. conservatism is about conserving classical liberalism. It's also about this polity conservatism per se, yeah. almost. I agree with that, and that's something that libertarians are quite weak on very often. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've thought of, I spent a lot of time thinking about this because, like, technically, like, formally speaking, could you have liberty in any kind of society, or does it require a certain type of society with a certain type of norms? Yeah. Uh, like, for example, when, for example, when we talk about liberty, like, um, uh, the most, you know. Uh, crazy sort of extreme libertarian ideas that I've had, I've heard in Sweden, usually coming from you fleeks, so like, I, I shouldn't, I, I'm not condemn, condemning like young people, uh, but it's been like legalizing uh, sexual relations with corpses, for example. That's a really extreme uh, idea, nothing that was ever proposed by someone like Edmund Burke or David Hume or Alan Smith. And it was kind of like beyond uh, their thinking. It was unimaginable. Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, if you want to push for liberty in every sort of way, you eventually end up wanting to sort of liberalize those things as well. Um, but, and I think it was Gertrude Himmelfarb who referred to this as, you know, the one simple principle uh, from John Stuart Mill, that, you know, their liberty is just one simple principle and then it starts to get applied to new sorts of contexts and then you end up applying it on the social structures 
uh, that might be necessary for liberty. I uh, completely agree. Uh, but then the question is, like, what would you say are necessary for this social structure? Like you've touched upon the nation state. Yeah. But what are the other things? Well, you we need a functional... Look, we're, we have... We're in government. We're in the nation state. And I don't consider that an issue. I don't consider it something to be justified. It's a, and we want it to be better rather than worse. We want it to be more functional rather than worse. And, and so you have to work with it, participate in it, join in it. And when we talk about policy issues, suppose we want to legalize sex with corpses. I mean, you're proposing that to a policymaker. You're sort of presupposing a whole policymaking context of, hey, let's legalize sex with corpses. Um, so really, we're very enmeshed in it, and and we it is what it is to some extent, and we want to make it more functional and more basically more agreeable to liberalism, uh, not necessarily in radical ways, uh, in, in, or in every way. There are exceptions. That's very much part of the 18th century way of seeing things. Um, so I don't know that we're, it's about specifying what all is necessary for liberty. I more take where we are as what we know. And you know and I know where we are and that's where we're working from. Like I'm not that interested in stepping outside of the, you know, the modern world of yeah. Western civilization, if you like. Um, but you're right that sometimes... Uh, Liberty has to be sacrificed for liberty, I would even say. Yeah. And that's something which, again, libertarians just can't deal with. It's not, not all of them. I don't want to be... I don't, I don't think it's really proper... No, we're not talking about all libertarians. We're not obviously. talking about all libertarians, because uh, some people can be... Yeah, well, I see what you're saying. I still am comfortable calling myself libertarian. Yeah. Hayek sometimes used the term libertarian. I mean, it's not just Murray Rothbard types. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But but if you try to back to this um, definitional uh, discussion, if, if you want to to are interested in seeing what's really the core values in policy and polity from a liberal point of view, are there any? Uh, you know, what is it? Was it? Was it? Uh, what is necessary to defend in a liberal society in when you speak about polity and policy? Yeah. I'm non-foundationalist when it comes to, well, why do you decide, why do you like that? <laughs> why is that your favorite flavor? Um, I, I, I'm not, it just seems better than the alternatives. So it's a very non-foundationalist. It's like, I'm situ again, I'm situ we're situated here. We've looked around, we've read history, we've compared other countries and uh, results, and we see sort of the options in different directions. You can go in and governmentalization of social affairs, by which I mean restriction, but also government is big players, dominating players. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't like the flavor. I don't, I don't like it. And I think a lot of people don't like it and instinctually don't like it, uh, but they don't really know how to translate that sense into you know, economic reasoning, political reasoning, and p political choice. Because uh, it's not a straightforward matter, um, so I don't really have a, a an ethical foundationalism mm. to answer your question. But for example, if you go into property, property rights, the right to own things, is that an absolute value, as you see it, or is it also something? It's that an important benchmark that carries presumptions. Mm. Uh, very strong presumptions when it's among equals, like mm. you and your neighbor. Uh, but also it should carry strong presumptions with the government as the, as the possible in, in, you know, uh, invader, the possible mm -hmm. um, initiator of coercion. That's sort of the presumption of liberty. Uh, that's, a, to me, almost the defining feature of liberalism. Mm -hmm. um, but again, why should we want that presumption and all that? I kind of feel we're back to, well, why do you like that movie? Mm -hmm. Do you have a foundational explanation mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that explains the movies you like, mm -hmm. what you find beautiful? Mm. Yeah, what is your comment? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, uh, touching back on, on this, well, I, I think from a conservative perspective, you're always talking about uh, 
like the development of society because if you're a conservative and I think this um, uh, common criticism for the left is that the conservatives are uh, always in favor of uh, what the left tried to push through or the liberals like in the libertarian sense uh, tried to reform uh, 50 years ago and that's kind of like what we're conserving um, and I was thinking about that because when you have all like if we talk about policy making uh, and the policy side if you have uh, small policy changes over time eventually you might end up uh, like accumulated uh, they might might have an impact on the polity yes uh, and but how should you then reason about liberty in policy should you be sort of reluctant to take those small steps just because you know that accumulated it depends which way they yeah. might go I mean this is again I'm not I'm not pretending to have a neutral point of view here. And no one of us are, I think. But no. <laughs> and, and so the polity sensibilities in this are not merely a conservatism. They're yeah. not otherwise neutral. They are pro-liberalism. Yeah. And so a lot of those small things, in fact, I think a big part of the reasoning of Smith and Hume for liberty was polity, the effects on the polity that yeah. it would change the way the people saw the world and it would regular, regularize things and equalize relationships and so on. And so they actually, I think, did consider polity consequences part of the argument for liberalism. And I say, yeah, if we think they're going in the right direction, okay, we've paused, we've you know thought about it and we're okay with going that way even though it stands to change the, the polity. It's, it's more just a, a readiness to admit that other sorts of policy changes could go in the other direction, and you gotta think seriously and responsibly about it. Don't just throw around radicalism, yeah. and don't ignore this in a loudish way where you, know, you just kind of, and, 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 and then you kind of draw these big distinctions between you and other people on the, the non-left, that we ought to be friends and coalitional yeah. about. Yeah, and I think that's a very good good point because when we start drawing distinctions, I, I know that some people, even might, even some people who might be watching this right now, uh, might kind of like shut down completely when they hear that like this thinker was conservative. Uh, then I'm not interested because I'm a liberal, uh, and vice versa. Yeah. Which because and when you look at them like Burke knew uh, Adam Smith uh, at least, and Adam Smith and David Hume are good pals. I think that David Hume and Edmund Burke. Yes, met, they're met. all friends. Yeah, Hume and Smith were closer. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like we have this troika, as you uh, refer to them. Uh, these three guys who were just hanging out together. It's quite funny to think of them like that, at least. Uh, and they shared many ideas. They deviated in some different ways, but philosophically, they had a very similar foundations. Uh, I all agree of them. with that. Uh, but then some people. But then we draw the sti distinctions and put them in different categories, and then we get back to like yeah. reality resists resists simplicity. And I think that's a very uh, very good point uh, to make to sort of tear down this liberal conservative dichotomy. Um, but what I was thinking about uh, as well relating to you know small policy changes having long term policy impacts. Like I guess from this perspective, if you think that the policy has been uh, damaged seriously uh, because of a radical change, would you then be uh, sort of, uh, would you then say that it's motivated to, uh, or like would someone like Adam Smith or even Edmund Burke, in your view, uh, say that it's motivated to do something really radical to kind of revert the course? It's possible. Uh, again, I think immigration, you know, clamping down on what would been had been a much more liberal regime what might be a sort of example of that. I'm not deciding it, I'm not pretending to decide it, but I respect that as an issue. And as a, as a liberal, I'm ready to, you know, be persuaded, yeah. you know, and it, so it's not about alienating ourselves from anybody who's for 
you know, tighter immigration yeah. restrictions than we're accustomed to. Uh, yeah, of course. But I was thinking as well that uh, Edmund Burke supported the American Revolution. Yes. But he opposed the French Revolutions. Yes. Uh, the French Revolution. Uh, and it's kind of easy to see when you take the liberal val values into account. Uh, but the American Revolution was still quite radical. Like, we're going to found a new country, like mm -hmm. these colonies. Um, and it led to a war. Uh, like that sort of, that's an extremely radical view yeah. and Edmund Burke took that's other radical views. Uh, uh, that's right, so he, he was not such a polity conservatism as maybe we're billing him as because he's in yeah. favor of letting the, the Americans go. Um, or was he? Was, was he in fact like defending a polity? Like I know, I think it was, yeah, it was the Tocqueville who remarked that, you know, Americans were just, when they did a revolution, they were just preserving their own old habits. Right. I mean, it's really very different than the French Revolution in, yeah. in that respect and in the sense that the Americans, you know, weren't sailing over to London to cut the king's head off and yeah, overthrow. Exactly. I mean, it's a, <laughs> so it's really more of a secession. I don't even like yeah. to use, I tend to use it as, a say, the War of Independence. Uh, it's more like, you know, the co these colonies seceded from yeah. the empire. Um, and it is in the spirit of a tradition that's extremely British. I mean, yeah. they were asserting their rights as Englishmen, as it were. Yeah. Um, and by the way, speaking of Englishmen, it should be noted that these three guys, none of them are English. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny. And so it's kind of takes maybe the guys from the periphery, Ireland for Burke and Scotland for the other two, to appreciate what England had going in terms yeah. of its stable functional polity and its you know, trend towards liberalism. And they were, they were developing that with a somewhat of an outsider perspective. It's kind of an interesting point to keep in mind. Yeah, that's true. Do you think it could have something to do with, like the, they were coming from these countries that perhaps like Ireland and Scotland, which didn't have exactly the same traditions relating to nobility? Um, yeah, I don't know. May I don't know, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, I think they probably just appreciated some of the virtues of the English system. Yeah. And, to, and 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 built on that. Sometimes I feel that way in Sweden. Sometimes I think some of you guys are too hard on <laughs> <laughs> Swedish <laughs> politics. Yeah, yeah. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have our own fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. But uh, back to the these cate categories, I, I'm, I'm a bit interested. So if you look into the polity when you think about more constitutional rights and the, the electorate and so on. You could say for Sweden and many European countries, you have had a quite stable polity over the last hundred years or so from the 1920s. More or less everyone has ha had the right to vote, more or less. Uh, but policy formation has been very strongly developing into a welfare state and to more governmentalization of, of uh, private uh, sector affairs and so on. Um, is, is this good or is it a sign of, of a defect model, model? I think it's a wrong direction. I think Western civilizations in a way have been going in a, in a wrong direction ever since the late 19th century, which I think is a, is a watershed period. Mm when intellectually liberalism really collapsed and mm -hmm. the young all of a sudden, I'm thinking especially of the Anglosphere, but the young are, are being taught different ideas. They, I think there was a bit, sort of a disappointment with liberalism, like, hey, you guys said it, this would make, make me happy and I'm still not happy. Um, so, you know, what, what's the deal? You should stop saying that they would be happy. Yeah, right, right. Stop you, saying that liberalism you, will make people happy. You will be unhappy. Um, so I think, I, I think, you know, the 20th century is unbelievably regrettable mm. in, in, in most of the policy respects. But is it also from a policy reform that this policy development has, has originated? Is it that you made the wrong decision on polity? You mean like has? expanding the electorate? Yeah, expanding the electorate or... Um, I don't know, that's in the cards and you know, I don't... I think it pertains. I do think it pertains in the sense that when you have universal suffrage, it so strengthens mm. 
the mythology of the nation state as consensual and sort of a band, kind of going back to our genes mm -hmm. from 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Hayek atavism idea. So I do think polit the, the, I do think democratic politics does play a big role in this, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that it shouldn't have happened, but we need to cope with it. We need to be state watchers, just like we need to be weight watchers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> do you agree on this, or do you have another view? On, on the weight it? watchers? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, the, the, the polity reformation during the last hundred years, and then its role in policy formation. That's a very small, narrow question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, I would say that... Yes, you could answer, <laughs> or no. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that... Uh, well, well, when I think about, you know, political development, it's all about, you know, building strong political coalitions and then you have a common purpose. And then it's inevitable that once you've achieved what you wanted to achieve with those coalitions, they sort of break down unless you fi find a new common purpose. And rediscovering that common purpose is extremely difficult. And I think that at different points in time when you talk about, you know, policy have been going in the wrong directions, it's usually just failing to find a common purpose. But I think that, broadly speaking, uh, some of, like, uh, I think that the policies have sort of, during the last century, and now I'm mostly speaking from a Swedish perspective, uh, I think that some of those developments were kind of understandable. Like, uh, we got, like, universal health care back in 1940s, and that was, uh, even though those policies were shaped by socialists in a Swedish context, uh, the right mostly agreed with it. And that related back to earlier conservative ideas on the right. Uh, that, that was kind of like, okay, we should take some kind of common responsibility for people uh, and have different kinds of social insurance programs. Now it uh, has probably gone more in the directions of just this general welfare state. And I think uh, that some of those, and I think it was Adam Smith who at some, some I think it was in the Wealth of Nations, pointed out that, you know, when we reached a certain, uh, certain, certain degree of material wealth, uh, it makes sense to have some sort of common, uh, common sort of health care system. I don't think he phrased it exactly that way. Uh, and I think you have, to, if you put it in that perspective, that we're now wealthier than we've ever been before in the history of mankind. Some of those developments were understandable and I believe to some extent necessary, but how they were shaped, and then I definitely agree that uh, liberals and conservatives in broad terms lost it out to socialism because the socialists managed to find a common purpose to build a co coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, and the liberals and conservatives failed because they disagree disagreed immensely on the necessity of those programs, on uh, the future of the world, like uh, in Sweden mm -hmm. and many other countries, uh, I know in the UK, for example, uh, people were talking about socialism as being the future uh, back in the 1970s, that, you know, uh, we were on the road to socialism. It was whether we would get there tomorrow or uh, we'll, we'll wait a couple of years. Uh, would this yeah. be uh, a slow, slide into socialism or would it happen at wo uh, all at once? Uh, and, that, uh, uh, and that is regrettable because that kind of gave the socialists a lot of leeway into just pushing through all these radical changes of society. Yeah. Um, and uh, still we haven't really found a proper coalition to kind of actually challenge those presumptions that we're still living with since then. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's part of what I call a, like this gesture. Yeah. That, yeah, in some sense, we might want there not to be certain social programs or to, to cut them back drastically. And we can have that intellectual conversation somewhere, and that's fine. But on the other hand, to be responsible, you got to also see what's necessary and practical and, yeah, what actually conduces to more liberty or less coercion yeah. um, and that's where I think we need to be more coalitional uh, yeah. in those in those ways and I think these three guys were yeah. you know very much had that
strategic sense about them. They yeah. were doing a liberal project, a project which I, I think is primarily a liberal yeah. project. It also strikes me that when we speak about this, that if you look, in, look into the continental European um, philosophy uh, uh, of the same time or early 19th century, if you look into Hegelian philosophy, and <laughs> we have yeah. been discussing that a bit, uh, you could say that he, he uh, described a system where w with a quite stable, well-specified polity, but with liberal principles in how the way most things should be organized in society. So there is also a similar structure there. Or I know you mm. have been thinking about this as well. Y yeah, and I, I'm thinking back to like Russell Kirk's description of Hegel, that he found very intricate ways of kind of motivating why the society he was living in at that specific moment in time was the perfect society. Mm. And then he sort of... Uh, and, I, uh, and I think there's a lot of things you can discover in Hegel, but I think there's always that lingering sort of authoritarian uh, streak uh, underneath in how he used society and you know the spirit uh, as he refers to it. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's the spirit in the English translation. Um, uh, and uh, I've tried to understand Hegel many times. Uh, I don't think I've succeeded yet. Um, you still have time. Uh, but <laughs> I think <laughs> that to pick this, uh, to take us out of the like Anglosphere in Sweden, because I think that Sweden has been very influenced by you know American politics and British politics, and then we've got this kind of liberalism and conservatism. But if you look at the European continent, they have still have the heritage of uh, you know Christian democracy, uh, Christian values implemented into economic systems, and you have all of these uh, economists uh, in Germany, like Röpke, who are quite influential in shaping Christian democracy. So I think uh, you have like a different conservatism involving from there as well, that kind of explains uh, uh, that's some part of the differences. Of this that's part of this broader point of view, in my view. I'm very yeah. big on the Larry Seedentop book yeah. that says that Christianity made liberalism possible. Yeah. I mean, I'm Definitely. kind of big on Christianity even yeah. though I don't go to church or anything. <laughs> um, I, want, I just wanted to add on Hegel. Um, I, th there's liberal interpretations of Hegel, and I can't, I can't say, but something I can say is that, and Hayek makes this point about philosophers and economists. Mm -hmm. He says, if you look at the great British philosoph social philosophers, um, or just even just general philosophers, like some of these guys here, Hume and Smith, the Mills, Locke, and others, they all do econ. They all do policy analysis. Hegel never did that. Mm. And, and in fact, most of the continental great philosophers lack that. They don't have their fingers into econ analysis and, and sort of policy, c comparative policy analysis and system-wide of you know how things work out in the way that so many of the Brits do. Once yeah. again, the Brits are sort of exceptional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also just touching on, on that point, I've I've heard it mentioned before that you know um, uh, that if you look at you know twentieth century, uh, most great conservative thinkers have been like. Uh, scholars in sociology or philosophy, all the greatest liberal thinkers have, like Milton Friedman or Friedrich Hayek, for example, were economists. Uh, so it's sort of like there's this divide in academia that seems to shape whether they're liberal or conservative, even if there's a bit of overlap. There. Well, I wouldn't quite put it that way. Most really? of the economists vote democratic. Yeah, yeah academia is pretty rock solid yeah, 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 at but this uh, point. Yeah, right. But I mean, if you look at if we talk about the right-wing thinkers, uh, only those guys, like uh, yeah. like Roger Scruton was a philosopher. Uh, you can talk about Charles Taylor, Taylor uh, mm. uh, sociolo uh, who was a professor of yeah, sociology, probably, yeah. uh, and then Gertrude, Gertrude uh, Himmelsfarb, uh, Russell Kirk, uh, all or Eric Vogelin, uh, all historians or uh, scholars in. Uh, scholars in a more humanist subject, while, while on the other hand, uh, 
the biggest liberal thinkers uh, of the 20th century, in my mind at least, are yeah. Milton Friedman, uh, Friedrich Hayek, who were economists. But if you read Hayek uh, in some of his work, his argument, he, he's arguing essentially for, uh, for maintaining a strong polity. Uh, and some of his arguments are very reminiscent of Burke. Now, he famously wrote that uh, why he is not a conservative, but I think you can still make a case that he was. So I was thinking about this divide that are liberals just conservatives who focus on economics or vice versa? Are conservatives just liberals? I don't, I don't see it that way. I, I don't know. No? Um, I see your point about the correlation with economists and liberal bent. Yeah. Um, but I just think certain things have tended to go together. I don't. I wouldn't define things that way. I think. Yeah. All right. But okay, guys. Uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, a great thanks to you, Dan, coming to us and introducing these concepts or uh, reminding us of these important concepts. I think it's a valuable way of thinking about liberalism and conservatism, and it's past and its future. And uh, Good to have you here, and thank you, Frederick, also for commenting. Thank you. And thanks to the audience watching us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you thank again. Thank you.